Did you ever wonder where the word gorilla comes from? Well, the story goes back a long ways. The fact of the matter is that Necho II was pharaoh of Egypt at one time, and he hired the Phoenicians, who were the world's greatest sailors, to go around Africa. They went out through the Red Sea, and they came back through the Pillars of Hercules, which we call Gibraltar today. The trip took them a couple of years. And we're pretty sure that that story is true for the very reason that the Greeks didn't believe it. You see, the Phoenicians reported that at some point along their trip, the sun appeared to be in the northern part of the sky instead of in the southern part. Now, the Greeks knew that that never happened. The sun was always in the south. But today, we know that when you go below the equator, as the Phoenicians apparently did, the sun does appear to be in the north. Now, about a hundred years after that, uh, in about the 5th century BC, there was a Phoenician sailing for Carthage, a General Hanno the Navigator. And Hanno took 60 ships, and uh, if you figure about 50 people per ship, you're talking about uh, several thousand people. And he went around down the scope of the side of Africa. And the reason that he did that was to establish uh, colonies. But when he got to the, near the end of his trip, as far down the coast of Africa as he intended to go, he discovered something very interesting. What he discovered, the local people called gorillas. And he reported that they were very hairy people. Now, we're not sure just exactly what Hanno discovered. We don't know if they were chimpanzees, we don't know if they were gorillas, we don't know if they were some kind of other ape, or if they were really just hairy people. But in the 19th century, uh, when people started uh, discovering uh, actual gorillas in, in Africa, they remembered the name that Hanno gave those animals. It's a good day for going to sea Hanno the navigator said to me There's an open sky and a steady breeze Up beyond the pillars of Hercules Above the foam-kissed waves Seagulls scream Up in the masts of our trireme And it's a good day for going to sea Hanno the navigator said to me Water Water From horizon to horizon All I see is water Still beyond all maps and charts Down along the coast of Africa The first Phoenicians on the speech While the monkeys jib around the parakeet screech Strangest women run wild down there Covered head to toe in fur and hair They fight like demons, better let them be Hanno the navigator said to me Water, water From horizon to horizon All I see is water Horsemen pull and curse and sweat Underneath this creaking deck At night I hear their stories told Strong through storms and weak for gold Carthage stands like an azure pearl Here in the middle of the known world And it's a good day for going to sea Hannah the navigator said to me Whoa. Water From horizon to horizon All I see is water 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 When 
my sailing days are done I'll see Poseidon's daughter It's a good day for going to sea Hi, Mother Navigator said to me There are two basic types of gorillas, uh, western and eastern. It's the western gorilla that you most often see in zoos. Eastern gorillas are much more rare. And it's the mountain gorilla that is a type of eastern gorilla. The first mountain gorillas uh, were reported back in 1902 by a German army captain, uh, Captain von Beringa. Von Bringo was in the area we call Rwanda today. At that time, it was German East Africa. And he shot two of the beasts. And he sent one of them back to Berlin for study. And this was a different kind of gorilla than anyone had ever seen before. And uh, as a result of that, people started talking about going in and doing research. The first researcher to go in was actually an American by the name of Carl Akeley. He went in in the 1920s. He was going uh, in part because he was employed by the American uh, Natural History Museum in New York. Now, this happens to have been the same Natural History Museum that someone else was working for at about that same time, and you may remember. His name was Roy Chapman Andrews. He's the guy that went up into Mongolia and his expedition found the first dinosaur eggs. Well, Carl Akeley was doing essentially the same thing that Roy Chapman Andrews was doing. He was collecting exhibit specimens. In 1921, American naturalist Carl Akeley made his way to the gorilla's ancestral home. The Virunga Volcanoes, in what was then the Belgian Congo. Akeley had come to collect mountain gorilla specimens for exhibit in New York. But each time the men stared into the eyes of a dead mountain gorilla, they saw a man-like creature staring back at them. Akeley decided the killing must end. He urged Belgium's King Albert to make a permanent sanctuary of the gorilla's home. Today, in the cold, rainy high ground of Rwanda, Uganda, and Zaire, the gorillas live on much as they have for thousands of years. After Carl Akeley's time, um, at about uh, in the late 1950s, 1959 or so, George Schaller, also an American, came up into these mountains to study the mountain gorilla. And then in 1967, he was followed by Diane Fossey, whom you know from the movie Gorillas in the Mist, if for no other reason. Rwanda is about the size of Massachusetts, and the reserve that King Albert set apart uh, for the mountain gorillas is that green area up there on the border of the Congo, Uganda, and Rwanda called Volcanoes National Park. 
There are in fact uh, seven volcanoes uh, in this area. Uh, they are largely fairly uh, dormant but the park is split by the national boundaries. That dotted line shows where the Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda happen to meet. Diane Fossey set up her research station, Karasoki, right almost on the Rwanda-Congo border. Those round symbols there indicate families of habituated gorillas. The triangles indicate unhabituated gorilla families. On the day that you go gorilla trekking, the first thing that happens is that all the tourists that are going to be going out trekking are taken to the ranger station. At the ranger station, the, the guides and the rangers get together and they decide which tourists will go to visit which gorillas. Now this can be quite important because some of the gorillas are much more difficult to get up to uh, than others. The folks making those critical decisions are in this little group and I watched them for a little while and they reminded me of the Chicago uh, stock market, commodities market. It looks to me like they use the open call system and uh, some hand signals to get their bids in. The tourists are reorganized uh, into groups of eight and this may not be the same group that you came to uh, the ranger station with. Vehicles then drive you to the location where the uh, uh, trek is going to be starting. Uh, it starts usually in an agricultural area. Incidentally, that's one of the volcanoes there in the background. Uh, that's, that volcano would have uh, gorillas living on it. This agriculture is actually on park property, or what was originally park property. Uh, for all practical purposes, now it's farmland. Uh, when you start out, uh, you'll notice that the park ranger is, is in the lead, and he's got an AK-47. That AK-47 uh, is not for the gorillas primarily, but there are other things in the forest like uh, elephants and buffalo and that sort of thing. Morning, Captain. The stone wall marks the boundary of the park. Uh, it wasn't built by the park authority, instead it was built by the local people, and it's primarily there to keep the buffalo and elephants fleeing out of the forest and raiding the crops. It doesn't stop the gorillas, however. As a practical matter, this starts the beginning of the trek through the forest. Now you'll notice uh, that uh, I'm wearing uh, gaiters. Uh, that's those uh, strips of cloth uh, protecting the ankles and lower legs. The reason I'm wearing them is because this forest is full of stinging nettles. There are two kinds. Some leave uh, only a, a few minutes worth of stinging and others leave several hours worth of stinging. But those little hairs that are on the plant are loaded with histamine and they can really cause you a lot of discomfort. Gorillas eat stinging nettles and so can you if you boil them first. The family that we're visiting is Quitonda. Uh, in fact, that's the name of the uh, silverback that's in charge of the group, and it means the humble one. The Quitonda group uh, actually was habituated in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. However, they crossed the border into Rwanda in 2005, and uh, they seem to be permanently in Rwanda now, where they're being carefully tracked. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is one of the groups that's uh, rather difficult to track, uh, along with the Sousa group, which is even worse. Quitonda's next-door neighbor is the Hirwa group. Uh, they're particularly interesting because in February uh, they had the uh, set of twins uh, born to the gorillas, and this is only the fifth set of twins ever recorded in history, at least for mountain gorillas. As you get close to the gorillas, the first thing you'll probably notice is a, a slightly sweet, uh, slightly musty smell. And you have to start paying attention to a gorilla etiquette at that point, otherwise you might make someone upset that you didn't want to.
When gorillas get aggressive, they go through a nine-stage display. You just saw most of the stages. There's a silverback back in that uh, vegetation there. But this isn't the old man. Uh, this particular group happens to have three silverbacks. Uh, the old man's about 40 years old. Uh, this person is in his teens still, and his name is Kigoma. He's sort of the first vice president. Kigoma is now attracting more female attention than the old man is, and is likely to take over the family eventually. As a matter of fact, Kigoma and Kitwanda have fought occasionally, although uh, it's also uh, common for uh, Kigoma to groom Kitwanda, so things are still working out all right in the family. Mountain gorillas are a type of eastern gorilla, and as such, they're the largest type of gorilla on the planet. Now, what makes mountain gorillas different is basically their thicker, longer hair than other gorilla species. And that means that they can stand colder temperatures, the colder temperatures they have up here in the mountains, where it's also rather damp. Males weigh about twice as much as females. The males can get well over six feet tall. They're usually around 500 pounds at the most, but they have come in at nearly 600 pounds for record size. The arm span is over seven feet. Mountain gorillas live between, oh, about 7,000 feet in altitude to about 14,000 feet in altitude. Uh, basically, they eat vegetation of all kinds. Uh, uh, and also assorted uh, insects and grubs. The adult males need about 75 pounds of vegetation a day, the females about 40. From the mountain gorilla's point of view, this forest is basically a very large salad bar. Mountain gorillas do not reproduce rapidly. The gestation period is uh, over eight months. The offspring are not weaned until they're about three years old. So it takes about four years between cycles. As a practical matter, uh, females generally only have one infant every six to eight years. And that means that over the course of their lifespan, they may only have between two and six offspring. They're everywhere. There's so many. The average dominant silverback is only king for about four or five years. This group is very unusual in that it has three silverbacks. Most groups, about 60% of all groups, have only one adult male in them. Now, that means about a third of the groups do have more than one adult male. Now, when the big guy moves, everybody moves. All the gorillas, all the people, everybody moves. And in this case, the big guy is going to move, but he's going to move to some place where you certainly wouldn't expect to see a mature male silverback. He's climbing a tree. <laughs> At this stage, one thing seems fairly likely. That is, something is likely to break. So why did he climb this tree to begin with? Uh, well, it's obvious after just watching him a couple of minutes, he's found something up there to eat. Uh, he's found mosses and lichens that apparently he's very attracted to. And he's nibbling around on very small plants that are growing up in that tree. <laughs> Well, so much for that dead branch. The fact of the matter is that vegetation is fairly hard to digest, harder than meat, for example. Uh, the result is uh, gorillas have to have uh, very large stomachs in order to be able to process all that vegetative matter. And in addition to that, uh, they have a tendency to have some digestive problems. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, we've seen the big guy now, uh, Quitanda, the leader of the group, the gorilla that climbed a tree. And earlier we saw Kigoma, the number one vice president, the second in charge, the silverback that's getting all the attention from the girls right now and is likely to be the successor. But where is the third silverback? Well, it turns out he's really quite close by and he's about ready to make an appearance. And because he's the third silverback and the smallest one, you'll have some idea how large the other two silverbacks actually are. When you think of a silverback and their behavior and function in the family, uh, there are several things that you normally think of. You think of him as leading the family, uh, selecting which uh, vegetation uh, to be going to to eat. Uh, you think of him as uh, fighting with other silverbacks and, uh, and so forth. But in addition to uh, settling disputes and maintaining order, uh, and, and things like that. Silverbacks do some other things that you might not expect. For example, when a, uh, a mother dies or leaves the group uh, and there are infants left behind, if there are offspring left behind, he will often allow them to sleep in his nest instead of the, what they would normally have done by sleeping in the mother's nest. And silverbacks are also capable of something else very surprising. That is, some silverbacks have been seen removing poachers' snares from the hands or feet of members of their group. Like most monkeys and other apes, uh, gorillas uh, have their infants, jockey style, on the mom's back for transportation. One of the most iconic things a gorilla can do, of course, is to beat him his chest in triumph when he achieves some feat. Apparently this gorilla was proud of himself for being able to get up that little tree. The time that you have to spend with the gorillas is limited to uh, one hour a day. A group can't stay longer than one hour with the gorillas. Uh, that's to give the gorillas a certain amount of uh, time away from people. And the groups that go to see the gorillas can't be more than eight. And there are no more than eight groups that go out. So there are only 64 people that can see these mountain gorillas each day. Not more than eight. I've seen gorillas on TV pretty often. And every time that I see them, there's always a cloud of insects around them, like this particular cloud that you see here. And I've always assumed that those insects were like mosquitoes or something else that was feeding directly off of the uh, gorillas. But my impression now is that that's not true. Instead, these flies are there for something else, and that's the gorilla dung. Awesome. Our time with this gorilla group uh, is now over, and we're going to have to leave. But I've got another gorilla group that we're going to be visiting, and that uh, group would, of course, been on another day. The next group of mountain gorillas is the Amahoro family. Now, the Amahoro family, well, uh, Amahoro means peace. But the Amahoro family is led by a silverback by the name of Obumwe. Obumwe means unity. This family lives on the slopes of the volcano called Besoke. The Amahoro group is a little harder to get to. We had a seven hour trek. This is the Amahoro group. And the big silverback that's with this one, which we'll see in just a second, that's Ubumwe. Now you hear two sounds. The first sound was the gorilla. Uh, he's basically communicating to the other gorillas, telling them that everything is all right. The second sound was a human repeating that sound 
so that the gorillas know we think everything is all right. In this national park, the gorilla population is increasing. As a matter of fact, it's roughly double what it was 30 years ago. 30 years ago, there were only about 250 gorillas that lived in this area. Now, there's nearly 500. In addition, there are approximately 300 mountain gorillas in the, the Bawindi Impenetrable Forest in Uganda. These mountain gorillas may, may not be exactly the same species as the ones in the Virunga Volcano area. There's a dispute about whether or not they could possibly be a separate subspecies. Next up, we have two young males in a wrestling match. As a matter of fact, this looks an awful lot like the high school wrestling that I was taught. Another thing gorillas like to do is they like to play tag. Uh, they play tag about the same way uh, that we do. Uh, one gorilla hits another and then runs off, uh, and then they get chased. Uh, of course, we can't tell for sure whether or not they're playing by the same rules that we do, but there was a study done involving five zoos, and over a period of three years, they recorded 86 different games of tag among gorillas. I was here quite a while watching these guys wrestle. Uh, they wrestle for a few minutes, and then they'll stop and take a break after a while. Uh, after they catch their breath, one of them will start it up again, and they'll wrestle some more. By the way, I, I know that those flies look terrible. They look like they would be bothering me considerably, and, and the gorillas too. But uh, I didn't actually uh, have any problem with them. Uh, there are uh, a lot of them, and they're flying all around, but they're not landing on you or biting you or anything like that. In a few seconds now, we're going to be coming up to a part of the, uh, the video uh, that I find most interesting uh, between these, these two young gorillas, and that is they appear to be tickling each other at this particular point. It'll be in the next little sequence. Watch the faces of the gorillas. Turns out that great apes are ticklish, so this could be tickling. Uh, it is known that chimpanzees and orangutans can tickle each other, for example. In humans, uh, usually tickling is limited to uh, children. Uh, by the time that you're about 40 or so, usually you're not quite as ticklish as you were before. And tickling may very well have a social function. Uh, it's one of those ways of communicating at the earliest possible uh, times between a child and mother, for example. While the boys were playing around, the other silvered back is going to be uh, coming around the corner. He'll be uh, approaching from the right side as you're looking at the gorillas. And this one is the number two silverback uh, in this particular family. silverback that's approaching from the right uh, now uh, is the number two silverback and when he was young he lost his left hand to a snare. In this area people don't set s snares uh, in order to get uh, mountain gorillas. Uh, instead those snares are set uh, for other things like antelope. It's unintentional uh, when a gorilla gets caught in one of these but it happens from time to time, and they do lose uh, feet and, and hands to those snares. This gorilla's name is Kolajiti, which means one-handed. I'm going to be leaving uh, these gorillas now, and I'm going to be following the old man. He's, in, he's moving now across a small valley uh, to some new vegetation. One thing that I've uh, emphasized to you is that it rains a lot here. In fact, it rains almost all year round. Uh, Rwanda has two seasons, the rainy season and the not-so-rainy season. 
Uh, we're in the not so rainy season right now. But mountain gorillas don't like rain. On the other hand, mountain gorillas don't know what to do about it either, which is interesting because orangutans have learned how to make umbrellas. I was videotaping the, uh, the silverback uh, across a little valley, but I was filming from a trail. And of course, there's a lot of vegetation around, which is why there is a trail. And then suddenly my guide told me to get off the trail because there were blackbacks coming up the trail, the ones that I'd been filming earlier, and they were, would want to get by. I got off the trail as quickly as I could and as far as I could, but as I went by, the gorillas hit me. You'll see the gorillas pass by me, and then the camera will shudder when they hit. They hit my leg as they passed by, so now I assume I'm it and I should chase them. But my hour is up, and I have to leave. Before I leave, I'd like to tell you a short story. Uh, this was from a video clip from a movie that I wanted to insert here because I think it tells you something interesting about the gorillas and how they interrelate with each other. Intwari is presenting himself as their new leader, but the females don't see it that way. Having forced Intori out, the group moves on. Before she joins them, Poppy, still vibrating with excess energy, vents it on the first young male she can find. Now isn't that just like life? This guy does absolutely nothing wrong, but he gets kicked for being the wrong gender, at the wrong place, and at the wrong time. I kind of know how the poor guy feels. I wasn't doing anything wrong either. One last thing before I go. Uh, people often ask me whether or not the uh, local people uh, are friendly. Uh, here are some children, and they're, they're great. Morning. Morning. How are you? Morning. Good 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 morning. Sometimes children ask for money and sometimes they ask for candy. Sometimes they ask for pins or books. And I'm always happy to try to give them pins or books if I possibly can, even though you're not supposed to. But these kids just wanted to say good morning. But now my time's up and I need to find a way home. <laughs>